Ray, consciousness is one of the great mysteries of human existence, and in recent decades, it's become a hot scientific subject. A lot of people are talking about it, not just the philosophers. How do you look at consciousness? Well, first of all, people mean a lot of different things by it. And sometimes people just routinely talk about consciousness as if it's a readily recognizable phenomena, and someday we'll just understand it. In fact, John Searle, who's who has a reputation of sort of defending the mysteries of consciousness, has said that someday we'll just understand the biological basis of, of consciousness and we'll see that it's some kind of biochemical acid or something that, that accounts for consciousness. I think fundamentally consciousness is its own sense of our, of our own awareness and is a synonym for subjectivity. And science, scientific inquiry, is a synonym for objective observation and then making deductions from there. And there's a gulf between objective observation and subjective experience. And there's no consciousness detector, objective scientific consciousness detector, we can even imagine building, we slide an entity in and a green light goes on, this one's conscious, no, this one's not, that doesn't have some philosophical assumptions built into it. So if John Searle were building it, he'd put in some biological, it'd have to be biological. And if it's not squirting biological neurotransmitters, it's not conscious. And Dan Dennett would have a different set that it have to be able to build models of its own experience in its own mind, but that mind could be non-biological. And that would be another set of assumptions. But there'd be some set of assumptions built into it. But fundamentally, we really can't objectively deter assess the subjective experience of another entity. We may look at an entity and look inside its brain, which may be biological, non-biological, we may see that it's building models of its own experience. It may be making decisions just like w the way a human does. It may have these feedback loops. But is, it, is that just a simulation of a human being? Is it really have a conscious experience or is it just some automatic process? Now, we just assume that other humans uh, that are acting conscious, because a lot of us don't uh, sometimes, uh, are conscious. But that's just an assumption. We, that actually breaks down when we talk about animals. Some people assume, well, animals aren't conscious. They're just acting by instinct, which is some primitive machine-like uh, mechanism. And other people feel that animals are conscious. So, and that's actually the underlying issue in the animal rights, animal suffering issue. We'll have this when it comes to machines. Now, we don't yet have machines that appear to be conscious. That You, know, you may meet a virtual person in a video game that says, I'm angry <laughs> or I'm happy. They don't yet have the subtle cues that we really convince us that they're really uh, experiencing these feelings. My prediction is that these entities will be so sophisticated and so subtle and will have the same complexity as human beings. In fact, will be based on reverse engineering the human brain that when they say I'm happy or I'm jealous, they really will have those subtle cues and we'll believe them because they really will be acting just with the same subtlety as human beings. Are they really conscious? Some people assume that, though, you have to be biological, will say no. Other people will say yes. I think we'll be convinced by them. That's really a political prediction, not so much a <laughs> philosophical insight, just because they'll be very smart and they'll be able to convince us. But fundamentally, there is this gap between objective observation, which is science, and subjective experience, which is another way of saying that there is a role for philosophy outside of science. Now, some people then go on and say, well, it's not, agree, it's not scientific. Therefore, it's an illusion. It doesn't really exist. We shouldn't really concern ourselves with it. But the problem with that is that if you, our morality and our legal system, to the extent that it's built on our sense of morality, is based on the issue of consciousness. If you cause suffering to someone because you attack them or you extinguish their, their consciousness, as in murder, that's considered immoral and a crime. If I destroy some property, it's okay if it's my property, if it's your property. Maybe it's not so okay, not because I'm causing suffering to your property, but I'm causing suffering to the owner. Uh, the, uh, the issue of consciousness and, and subjective feeling is the fundamental basis of our moral system. So we can't just ignore it. Sure, but that doesn't make it right or not. I mean, just because our, our moral and legal system is based upon consciousness doesn't go back and have anything to say reverse that consciousness is either real or not. Maybe our, our system is wrong. I mean, it would be nice if consciousness were real. 
So I, I think it's still an open issue, but I, I, I think what you're saying is there are two kinds of conscience. One is sort of the apparent uh, aspect of consciousness that a, that a third party could judge, and, a, and another is the internal experience of it, which is beyond science. That's right. And my prediction is that the apparent consciousness, seeing an entity that is really very convincing when it, when it exhibits these emotional reactions, uh, that will occur within about a quarter of a century. In non-biological In non-biological systems. So we'll have systems that can pass the so-called Turing test, because they're really convincing when they talk about having the human range of emotions. And if you accuse that system of being not conscious, it may get mad at you. It, it'll get mad at us, and, <laughs> and it'll be very smart, and it'll make us feel bad, and it'll convince us that it's conscious. But you talk about fundamentally, philosophically, there's no way to prove that it's conscious. Some people say, well, it's just a machine, and we understand how it works, and here's the software, and we can print out the source code, and therefore it's just a simulation, and a simulation isn't reality, and so that's a philosophical issue. Is there a difference between a true simulation that captures every essence, every aspect of a, of a process, and the real thing? Uh, fundamentally, we can't really experience another entity's consciousness, and that's actually a practical problem. When, when we look at indifference in the world or prejudice or, and the oppression of one people against another, it's very often because one set of people can't really empathize, uh, really feel the emotions mm -hmm. of someone else. We can't really put ourselves in someone else's shoes. The whole, the whole word empathy is only about a century old. Uh, and we do have some limited ability to do that. We have these mirror neurons, but really we can't we can try to infer what other people are feeling, but we don't really experience their consciousness. And that fundamentally becomes a philosophical and, and is this something just beyond our technology, or is it in principle impossible forever, no matter how strong our technology becomes? Well, it's like an onion. We can keep peeling the onion. In the middle is the essence, but there's really nothing there. Uh, fundamentally, there will always be a philosophical gap. Now, that doesn't mean we can't study for example, neurological correlates of, of sure. consciousness. Uh, we can study what goes on in the brain of someone who claims to be conscious and appears to be conscious versus someone who appears to be unconscious. And if somebody says they have a certain emotion and their face, facial expressions reflects that, we can believe that that's the case and look at what's going on inside their brain. So we can certainly study a lot of uh, issues with how the brain is processing emotion and and these different feelings. But fundamentally, we can't really grasp the essence of consciousness as a scientific subject because there is this gap between subjective experience and objective observation. And that difference is a, a, an unbridgeable chasm. Ultimately, yes. I mean, I think not everything will be subject to science, uh, but we. It doesn't mean we can't study. We can keep getting greater and greater insight as to what is actually going on inside the brain when people evidence certain emotions. But, uh, you know, each of us uh, has our own subjective experiences. We don't experience someone else. I've talked about how we can actually ultimately attach our brain to someone else's sensory inputs and we'll actually feel like what, what someone else is feeling, kind of like the plot concept of the movie being John Malkovich. But that's still our own consciousness, just getting different input signals. It's not really putting ourselves in someone else's shoes. I think there is that, that uh, unbridgeable gap there. And, and people really need to realize that and not talk glibly about consciousness as, as if it's just another biological process like di digestion or lactation, and we can just discover the biological basis for it.